Chapter 23. Detective Jason Marshall didn't usually work on Sundays, but he isn't, wasn't going to relax until he tracked down Dwayne Scrooge Jr., the missing arsonist suspect. It didn't help that the other detectives kept needling him because the kid had dashed away before he could snap handcuffs on him, and then he easily had outrun him. Every night, Jason Marshall took two aspirins and pressed a heating pad against some sore hamstring muscle and drifted off into a fitful sleep, wondering where Dwayne Jr. was hiding. And every morning, Jason Marshall woke up thinking how the evidence to follow might lead him to the boy or at least lock up the arson case. On this particular day, the detective decided to skip church and do some internet research on the handheld butane torches. The brand found in Dwayne Screw Jr.'s book bag was called the Ultra Igniter, and the company's website helpfully provided a list full of retailer outlets that sold each products in Coil, Coiler County. There were only three all hardware stores. One had gone out of business, and Jason Marshall figured the other two would be closed on Sunday. But he was wrong. The store on the east side of Naples was open. The detective drove down there, bringing a photograph of Dwayne Scrooge Jr. that had been taken after his arrest for setting fire to the billboard. The owner of the hardware store swore he had never seen the kid before. Did you, do you sell a lot of those igniter torches? The detective asked. Not many, the store owner replied. I can look it up on the computer and tell you the exact number. The store had sold only two ultra igniters during the past 30 days. Jason Marshall wrote down the dates. Would you happen to have the name of the customers, I suppose? The detective said, Nope, all I can tell you is that both items were bought with a credit card. Are you sure about that? Yep, our inventory software keeps track of whether it's cash or plastic, the store owner explained. Jason Marshall thought it was highly unlikely that Jane Dwayne Screw Jr. would be using a credit card unless it belonged to his father or he stole it. I noticed you've got some security cameras, the detective said. Doesn't everybody these days? Do you still have those videotapes from the dates I, you sold the ultra igniters? I doubt it, the store owner replied, which was a lie. He saved all his security videotapes for six months in case they were needed to prosecute shoplifters. On this particular day, he just didn't feel like going through hours of videos. Let's take a look, Jason Marshall said. Actually, I'm sort of busy right now. Maybe you could stop by another time. I'm pretty busy myself, too, said Jason Marshall, so let's see those tapes. It didn't take very long to review the surveillance film, and the detective found both sales transactions that he was looking for. He informed the store owner that he was keeping the tapes as evidence. What's this all about, the man said. Am I in trouble or something? Not at all, Jason Marshall said. Driving back to the sheriff's office, he phoned Torkelson, the arson's investigator with the fire department. He told him he located a store that sold, the two, butane, that sold two butane torches identical to the one found in the backpack. One was bought the day before the fire, said the detective. Good work. But the second one was purchased only three days ago. The arson investigator said, I don't care about that one. Well, you should, Jason Marshall said, because the same guy bought both of them, and it was not the screwed kid. How do you know? The hardware store has security cameras. I got the tapes. There was an edgy silence on the other end. Torkelson tried to remain, figure out what this information could mean. Maybe the boy has an accomplice. Maybe he bought the second torch because they were planning another fire. How old is the customer on the video? Between 55 and 60, I'd say. Oh, said Torkelson. So it's not the boy's father. Nope. Well, there's got to be an explanation. I can think of one, the detective said. Let's hear it. Maybe we're after wrong guy. Another uneasy pause, and the arson investigator said, I need to see those tapes. Yes, you do, agreed Jason Marshall. The oak tree was 40 feet high and dead as a doornail, killed years ago by a lightning strike, way up high in the hole of the trunk where the female raccoon was living with the three little ones. One day, a huge backhoe arrived at the lot and started smashing down trees. The boy, who had been spying on the raccoon family for weeks, jumped off his bicycle and shouted as the driver of the backhoe on steer clear of the dead oak. But the driver never heard him. He just waved the boy away, revved the big machine, and flattened the den tree, killing all the raccoons, another, including the mother. The boy could not do nothing but watch him from a distance and sob. The construction company, the owed backhoe, was clearing the property to make way for the patio furniture warehouse. Two days after all the trees were demolished, the company set up a shiny double-wide office trailer with a bright banner heralding the new project. The same night, the boy rode his bike out of the property and set fire to the double wide, which burned a rather immense and twisted cinder. Nobody inside was inside at the time. I made sure of that, Smoke assured Nick, 
who listened to the entire arson story without interrupting. See, I'm not a true pyro, Smoke added. I didn't do it for kicks. I was just mad. Still, that's dumb is the word. Same with torching the billboard, Smoke said. My mom had just taken off for Paris and I was all messed up. When I saw the big sign for the airline, I flipped out. You wouldn't understand, dude. Nobody does. Nick didn't say anything. It was impossible for him to envision his own mother getting on a plane and flying away forever without saying goodbye. Such heartbreak was beyond Nick's experience. Smoke chuckled bitterly. They built that stupid furniture warehouse anyways, just like they put up the brand new billboard in the same spot as the other one. Did you set any other fires, Nick said? Never. So why do you want people to call you Smoke? Because it's way cooler than Dwayne. They were sitting on the floor in Nick's bedroom. The shades were drawn and the door was locked. Twilly says you're a tracker, Nick said. Well, it's the only thing I'm good at, I guess. He says that if anybody can find the Mother Panther, it's you. I sure aim to try, Smoke said with determination. Mrs. Starch said there's not much time. She's right, and this bloodhound sniffing all over the place doesn't make my job any easier, Smoke said. Wild cats run around like crazy from dogs. Nick had to ask, what's the deal with you and her? Mrs. Starch? She's not so bad. Everybody thought you hated her guts after what happened in class. Smoked grin. For sure I did, but come to find out she's not as mean as she acts. Hey, I heard a car pull up. Moments later, the front door opened and Nick's mother was calling his name. Smoke grabbed him by the shoulders. Don't say a word about me. But I can't lie, Nick whispered. Listen, bro, once she knows I'm hiding here, she's going to have to go to the cops or she's going to go to jail. What are you talking about? Harboring a fugitive is what I'm talking about, Smoke said. If you tell your mom I'm here, you're dragging her into the middle of the whole mess. Is that what you want? From down the hall, Nikki, where are you? I'll be right out, Mom. Smoke edged himself sideways into Nick's bedroom closet. Go, he said. Act like nothing's wrong. Nick slipped out the door and closed it behind him. He walked down the hall to the living room where he, he was surprised to see his mother wasn't alone. Nikki, you remember Peyton? Sure, he said. Peyton Lynch had been one of Nick's regular babysitters back when he's in elementary school, when she was in high school. And now she's in high school. Now, now she's attending junior college and worked part-time at a sandal shop. Hey, Nikki, she smacked through a cheerful mouthful of bubble gum. Nikki's mother said Peyton would be staying at the house for a few days while she went and saw his father. There's a flight to Fort Myers late this afternoon that connects to Washington. That's good, Nick said. And it was for Nick's dad and also for Nick. Peyton Lynch is a nice girl, but she's not the sharpest knife in the drawer, said Mrs. Starch, might stay. When Nick was little, he'd pretty much done whatever he pleased while Peyton was there because she was usually yakking on the phone or painting her toenails blue or staring at MTV. She was the ideal babysitter, clueless. One time when Nick was nine years old, he accidentally bounced a golf ball through the screen of his desktop computer. Peyton hadn't heard the tube explode because her headphones were turned up so loud. Nor had she shown the slightest spark of curiosity when Nick had emerged from his room carrying a box full of broken glass. Nick's mother said, make yourself a home, Peyton. I'll go finish packing. Peyton dropped her travel bag on the rug and plopped down on the sofa. So how's school, Nikki? It's okay, she said. Hey, do you guys have any diet Snapple? Uh, I don't think so. Green tea, she said, plugging her iPods into, into her ears. Tofu burgers, spring rolls? I'll check the fridge, said Nick, smiling to himself. Peyton Lynch would never notice Dwayne Screw Jr. was staying in the house as long as he didn't park his motorcycle in the kitchen. Drake McBride was extremely annoyed. With a groan, he pushed himself out of bed and hobbled after Jimmy Lee Bayless in the sitting room where the dog handler waited somberly. What happened? Drake McBride demanded with a no trace of sympathy. The dog handler said, you owe me $2,000 because your dumb dog got lost? You out of your mind? Horace didn't get lost, the man said flatly. I ain't leaving here till I get my money. Jimmy Lee Bayless bit his lip. He strongly urged his boss to pay the man and be done with it. But Drake McBride said, no way, partner, not one red cent. Here's what I think, Drake McBride said, buttoning his purple pajama top up. I think you tried to scam us with your defective hound dog. I think Horace couldn't find his own bottom in a bread box. The handler wasn't as tall as Drake McBride, but he was weary and tough. Jimmy Lee Bayless knew the type. Look, whatever happened out there, that man's dog is gone, Jimmy Lee Bayless said, and we need to reach some sort of agreement. Horace was a champion tracker. Horace was the best, the handler stated proudly. Horace was a dud, Drake McBride crackled. Whoever heard of a handler bloodhound getting lost? At that point, 
Jimmy Lee Bayless realized that nothing could be done to save Drake McBride from his own big mouth. The president of the Red Diamond Energy Corporation was now pinned against the wall of the hotel room, his face turning the same color as the ridiculous pajamas. Horace did not get himself lost. He got killed, the dog handler said, squeezing him. He got eight. Jimmy Lee Bayless attempted to pry the man's hand off J Drake McBride's neck, but the handler was not very strong and very angry. Drake McBride's eyeballs were bulging and his arms were flapping and his mousy little squeaks were leaking out of his lungs. Let go of him, please, Jimmy Lee Bayless explored. He'll pay you two grand. And apologize for what he said about Horace? He'll take out an ad in the paper if you want. The dog handler released the hold on Drake McBride, who crumpled to his knees on the carpet. After five solid minutes of hacking and wheezing, he finally recaptured his breath and said he was sorry. Give me my money, the handler said. You say your dog got eaten. Bet on it. Eaten by what, if I may ask? Like you don't know, the man said coldly. Drake McBride looked quizzily at Jamie Lee Bayless. What are you talking about? To himself, Jimmy Lee Bayless thought, I'm employed by a total moron. He's talking about the panther, sir. Ha, ain't no panthers out there, Drake McBride demanded. It was, but it was all a bluster. His face was pale as a mask of anxiety. The dog handler said, I saw the scat myself. You're mistaken, pal. It was most likely a bobcat. Yeah, the man yanked Drake McBride to his feet and then shoved him in the armchair. I know bobcat scat from panther scat, and I know what I did saw didn't come from no puny bobcat. In fear of another throttling, Drake McBride gave up the argument. Whatever you say, you're the expert. That I am, the handler said. To bring the conversation to a peaceful ending, Jimmy Lee Bayless explained to Drake McBride that the handler would never have allowed Horace to track a scent through a black vine swamp had he known a panther was lurking in the area. The dog's purely a human hunter, not a cat hunter, Jimmy Lee Bayless said. I believe we've got our obligation to compensate the man for his loss. All right, all right, Drake McBride mumbled and limped to the bedroom to get his checkbook. The handler said, out west, they have special cat hounds for hunting cougars. But Horace, he was school, He wasn't schooled for that. He'd probably just run up that old panther without even barking, get himself killed and ate. Thing is, I had a fondness for that old fella. We're very sorry this happened. Deeply sorry, Jimmy Lee Bayless said in his most sincere sounding voice. You ought to be, said the handler. Mr. McBride and I had no idea there was a dangerous panther on our land. Know what? I think you're both full of crap. Jimmy the Bayless didn't dispute the point. His boss returned and slumped into the armchair, a ballpoint pen in one hand and a checkpoint on, check book open on his lap. With forced politeness, he said, 2,000 even, right? The dog handler rubbed his leathery chin with a pondering way that caused Jimmy the Bayless to grope for his tums. Right, for Horace disappearing, his struck his red-hot trail. It led us off your company's land all the way over to the next section where you can't believe what I found, or maybe you can. Jimmy the Bayless swallowed a sour burp. Drake McBride's shoulders drooped. There was a big old stack of pipes and box of drilling gear and dog handler went on. Like somebody was fixing a sink and oil well on state property. You can't never guess what the name on those labels of them crates said, or maybe you can. It was Red Diamond Energy, same as your outfit. Ain't that odd? Drake McBride looked up and croaked. What exactly do you want from me, mister? The handler gave a long, phony shirt, sigh. I sure do miss my hound dog. Jimmy the Bayless said, cut to the chase. How much, how does 5,000 bucks sound? Real fine is how that sounds to me. But if anybody asked, you never set foot in section 22, did you? You didn't see no mud pit or drilling equipment or nothing. No, sir, the handler said. The only one who knows different is Horace, and he ain't here to spill the beans. God rest his soul. Drake McBride scowled. Stop. You're going to make me cry. He scribbled the check for $5,000, handed it to the handler. Here, now go buy yourself another mutt, he said, and he staggered back to the bed. End of 